Good evening, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As you know, it's just after <coughs> 8.30 here in the United Kingdom. We're coming to you live from the studios of British Muslim TV here in Wakefield. With this week's edition of Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, we're broadcasting on Sky Channel 752 and across social media. Um, wherever you are joining us, a very warm welcome. Now, I hope you've had a good eat with uh, your family. And uh, I, hope, I hope it was good. For me, it was, um, it was a blessed time for me. Spent it uh, with my children and wider family. It was an opportunity to just switch off and focus on the important people in life, which is your family and your friends. And uh, it was also an opportunity for us to give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the blessings and the mercies that he's bestowed upon us all. And so wherever you are around the world, we thank you for your continued support here on British Muslim TV. Um, so we want to ask you to comment on the stories we're going to be covering tonight, particularly on Pakistan uh, and also about how young people should be educated, inspired and encouraged to develop their careers and have the right role models in the workplace and in wider society so that they can make a positive difference to communities. That is something we'll be talking uh, about later. Now, you can call us now on 01924-231-083. Message us on WhatsApp number, which is on the screen now. And if you're watching this on Facebook Live, a good evening and welcome. Post your comment in the chat box and we'll get through some of them um, on air later. And we've been off for a few weeks. So tonight we're going we're gonna to head to Manchester, talk to Hamid al-Mashriki about uh, the situation in Pakistan, what is happening um, as we head towards what's being billed as crucial elections on Sunday, the Punjab Assembly, um, Provincial Assembly elections. These are by-elections. These were 20 members of PTI, the party of Imran Khan, who basically in Pakistan, they're not allowed, if you're elected under a party ticket, you have to support nominations for chief minister, uh, and votes of confidence uh, for your party. You cannot abstain and you cannot vote for another party. And uh, what's happened is those 20 PTI assembly members voted uh, for Hamza Shabazz, the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz uh, nomination. And that was the reason uh, why uh, they were stripped of their seats and they were denotified. And those by-elections are happening in those uh, 20 seats across Punjab and the political leaders are out and about making their final preparations for that by-election which is happening on Sunday uh, and it'll be interesting to see how we uh, deal with that. And we'll be asking the question, we're asking you the question, what is Pakistan in turmoil and what can be done? Um, and then we finish off, as I said, we head to the northwest and we go to Chorley in Lancashire and talk to Professor Waqar Ahmed about inspiring young people through the Young Professional Society. A really important conversation. So we want to hear from you tonight. You can call us now on 01924-231-083. You can message us on social media. Our handles are British Muslim TV. And alternative, you can send us a WhatsApp message. The number is on the screen as we speak. Now, the questions we're considering tonight. Is Pakistan in turmoil? How can we inspire young professionals? And with President Joe Biden in the Middle East tonight, do you have any confidence or hope that peace will prevail between the Israelis and the Palestinians? Please share your thoughts now on 01924 231 083, or you can message us on WhatsApp. Uh, I will read some of your comments throughout the program. Let's get started on the first topic. Now, in April uh, 2020, in April 2020, former Prime Minister Imran Khan of the Pakistan Tehreek e Insaf Party lost a vote of confidence in the Pakistan National Assembly. Now, that was following the coalition partners who he had joined forces with uh, decided to leave his government and they went and joined the opposition. Now, since then, inflation has massively increased. And the cost of living crisis has led to a question about the impact on everyday people. 
Now, with by-elections, as I said, in Punjab on Sunday, the 17th of July, who will win? And what will be the consequences? Now, parliamentary elections are not expected until 2023. Can the Shabazz Sharif government hold on? And what will happen in Pakistan in the weeks to come? Now, Hamid al-Mashriqi is a Pakistani broadcaster, commentator, uh, based here in the UK in Manchester. And I'm pleased to say Hamid is a regular contributor to our programme and we're really excited that he is joining us. Uh, Hamid, by warm welcome to the programme. Such honour to have this conversation once again. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Uh, first of all, how was your Eid? It was brilliant. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. It was brilliant, as good as it should be. And good job is that plenty of people could uh, perform Hajj. A lot of my friends, they were waiting. I wanted to go as well, but unfortunately, I couldn't make it. But inshallah, next year. But a lot of people could make it this year. That's the good news for this year. Yeah, and uh, we will be coming and talking uh, about the Hajj uproar that has happened over the past uh, few weeks, uh, a few weeks for sure. Right, just let's just get started. Where are we with the Punjab Assembly by-elections? They're happening on Sunday. What is your thoughts about how that will develop? Who will win in those 20 seats? Uh, I think it's a, it's a million-dollar question. It's not easy That's why I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you. It's a, uh, to be honest, uh, political scenario in Pakistan is very critical, very divided, and a lot of things can happen. And uh, to be honest, it should. Uh, the, there is only one question uh, in my mind, in everybody's mind, that the elections should be fair and free, without any pressure, without any interference, and let the public decide who they want to vote this time. The, uh, normally, in, uh, as you know, in Pakistan, the by-elections are not that important normally. But these by-elections of these 20 seats are very decisive because it, uh, the, the current chief minister is actually... Uh, not on the majority, and he has to win at least 10 seats to maintain his majority and to remain as a chief minister, which is Hamza Shahbaz Sharif, son of Prime Minister uh, Shahbaz Sharif. But on the other hand, the popularity of PTI, since Imran Khan has been ousted after that vote of no confidence on 10th of April 2022, he has gained so much popularity based on his narrative that he has been a uh, victim of a conspiracy and that's why he uh, he was working for the independent foreign policy of Pakistan. And his narrative has been very much popular in the public. And uh, we can see that uh, his, his public gatherings, his, his rallies, it's, it's, people are coming in thousands. So, I mean, it's going to be very mm. critical elections. All the polls, even uh, the, uh, the the newspapers or the uh, TV channels who are in favor of government, apparently, even their polls are saying that at the moment, uh, PTI is in a leading position. So if it goes like it looks like, uh, there will be very hard for Shahamza Shahbaz to stay as a chief minister. And then the Electoral Commission of Pakistan, uh, the, in, for, for our viewers' sake, there are reserve seats for minorities and uh, uh, for women. And PTI yeah. have got those five seats. How significant is that? Uh, that is very significant, and uh, uh, if I let your viewer know as well that unfortunately, when uh, you know these uh, twenty uh, candidates been uh, disqualified and uh, the re-election was called, these five seats were supposed to go automatically to PTI, but PTI has to go to the High Court and then Supreme Court to uh, to ask the uh, uh, you know court to give them these five reserve seats, and they are very crucial now. Uh, PTI have got 177 seats, uh, you know, and they are they are very close as well to the. So they are they've got 172 seats, and they they just need 11 more seats to make 183, 84, which is required figure. Only thing is that if uh, Nawaz Sharif and PMLN won more than 11 seats, then out of these five seats will go back three seats to Hamza Shehbaz as well. So this is the critical, uh, you know, ca calculation game here because reserve seats are divided on the number of seats a party won in a uh, in a public election or in the general election. So the number of seats, higher number of seats, means that you will get automatically more number of reserve seats for your uh, party as well. 
So at the moment, these five seats are also going to be decisive after the election results. Mm. That's going to be really interesting. Uh, and we're actually, <laughs> sorry, when do you think we could get some results? Will that be on Sunday night? Uh, we will get initial results by Sunday night, but uh, I'll, I'll say we will have it uh, in the UK. Uh, midnight, we will have the results, but it will be early morning in Pakistan. So it, it always takes 10 to 12 hours to compile the results, which means same here as well. It does take time, but as long as there is no, I mean, God forbid, any bloodshed happened or any, uh, you know, violence, that is the biggest fear at the moment in everybody's mind that if there will be any, uh, you know, violence there or it could erupt any problems, then uh, who knows what could happen. And uh, I mean, we all pray that inshallah it will go smoothly and fair and transparent elections are the biggest requirement and biggest demand from uh, PTI at the moment. Mm. Pakistan time in Islam. And what do you make of the accusations from both sides? Uh, we've got about 90 seconds before the break, but both sides, both parties, opposition parties and uh, P PML Noon, claiming that the vote is being rigged and there is going to be... Uh, Shafiq, I mean, uh, uh, it, it doesn't make sense for the ruling party to make any accusations or allegations of rigging because they are supposed to be in power and uh, they can manage everything. But obviously they are trying to uh, call these riggings because they want to uh, have a face saving if, in case if they lost the election. But on the other hand, uh, PTI is giving evidences that the voter list is, has been changed. Some of the voters been shifted to different constituencies. And that's why there are many ambiguities uh, in these new voter lists, which has been claimed by the PTI that they need to be sorted before the uh, 17th, which is highly unlikely. But uh, I will say that the both parties should uh, should uh, make, uh, you know, peaceful arrangements yeah. and the sense yeah. should prevail Hamid, rather than going... Ha Hamid, I know you're staying with us for the hour, so we're really grateful. We're going to be talking about Pakistan politics, but also be talking about President Joe Biden, who's arrived in the Middle East tonight on his first official visit to the Middle East as president. He's in Israel and he will meet the Palestinians on Friday and then head to Saudi Arabia. We'll talk to uh, Hamid about that. But let's take a very quick break. We'll be back very shortly. Join us on the other side of this. Assalamu alaikum. Rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq. As I was saying just before the break, when we get to the second part of the program uh, after the next break, uh, we'll, we'll look at what is happening with President Joe Biden. Uh, he's arrived. He has arrived in Israel. Um, and he is there for a two-day visit. He'll, he'll travel to the West Bank city of Bethlehem uh, and meet with the uh, PLO president, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, uh, and the Palestinian leadership. And he then heads to Saudi Arabia. He'll be going to Jeddah, where he'll be participating in a, a Gulf Cooperation Council summit. And he will be having bilateral meetings with the king of Saudi Arabia, King Salman, and the crown prince, Mohammed bin Salman. And so we will have a reflect on that and reflect uh, in regards to what does that mean for Middle East peace process and what does it mean for the relationship between the United States uh, and our allies in the region. So we are still joined by the one and only Hamid al-Mashriki, who's just told me during the break, I'm one of his favorite presenters, and so he's made my day. Um, Hamid, you've made my day. Um, thank you so much so that, for that. That's all that's all that's yeah, uh, we, we, we'll have to make it up to you next time I'm in Manchester. Um, so tell yeah, us, exactly. there's, lo there's been lots of protest, lots of rallies by Imran Khan, thousands upon thousands of people coming out, but also there's been big rallies from the opposition parties across Punjab in, in light of these by-elections. How, how do you see events developing in terms of these rallies? And do you think the momentum is still with Imran Khan? Uh, it is, uh, I mean, if, uh, it is with Imran Khan, but we cannot say that uh, Islam League Noon have no popularity. They have equally enjoyed the popularity. They are in the government. Their rallies are very big. So, I mean, as you know, that Punjab was a safe haven for, uh, in terms of voting for Nawaz Sharif and PMLN. So, I mean, uh, in, especially in the rural areas, they always won the election in central Punjab and then in, in certain parts of south Punjab. And so, I mean, uh, it is going to be a tight uh, contest. The only reason is that the people 
uh, you know, the candidates from PTI, uh, they are, uh, you know, exploiting or using, uh, you know, the slogans of Imran Khan that this time they have, people have to vote for the independence foreign policy. People have to vote for, uh, for the people who do not do the corruption. So those narratives are very popular, but I mean, uh, Nawaz is, is doing uh, uh, very good as well, and they are looking to vote about 14 to 15 seats as well. Equally, PTI is saying they might win 18 seats. So the claims are big from the both sides, and we will know by the morning of 17th of July, 18th July. Yeah. And we know this week uh, the extraordinary uh, arrest of Pakistan journalist Imran Riaz Khan uh, last week, where he was paraded from one police station to another, one court case to another. And it transpired, I don't know if you've seen this news tonight, which has been breaking, that the person who is alleged to have put in the yeah, FIR uh, in Chakwal has actually denied ever doing it. And, and the allegation is, which obviously we, we can't, it's just an allegation at this point, that his name was used by the police and the authorities. What do you make of his arrest and the fact that Pakistan is becoming more authoritarian and dangerous for journalists like you and me? Uh, yeah, I mean, Shafiq, I'll tell you, uh, with Riyaz, Imran Riaz, I have done a few programs with him. I have played cricket with him. We are good friends. And uh, I was very uh, disappointed at his arrest, but I already anticipated as well about five, five to six days prior to his arrest that the way he's been expressive, the way he's been criticizing establishment and other institutions, eventually they will arrest him. So it, that's what happened. Uh, I mean, I was anticipated, but it was, it is absolutely, I mean, we should condemn that. Uh, it is against the basic human rights. It is against the basic, uh, right, fundamental rights of freedom of speech. And it is, I mean, happening to a journalist who's, uh, who's talking uh, about the fairness, about the, uh, you know, transparency, who's talking about the equal rights, and who is talking about uh, uh, the rights of the people. So there, there was no reason for his arrest. And the, the incident which you are mentioning about the Chakwal first investigation report against him, and that has been withdrawn by the person who's been nominated in it, Actually, uh, if you there was about 20 FIRs across Pakistan and in mainly in Punjab province, and uh, all of them were written in the same format, uh, using the same wording, using the same allegations, using the same uh, you know criminal codes. So it was uh, it looks like that it was been written by the same person. So there was very valid evidence that they are not. Uh, you know, rightly submitted from those people. And uh, we have seen today one of the nominee have openly said that I was not informed about it. And I, if there is my name, I want to withdraw that FIR. And, uh, you know, uh, Imran Riaz have uh, for, forgiven the person. He said, I will, I will not uh, take any action against you if your name has been used and uh, you, you are not aware of it. You are, so Imran Riaz has shown a big heart about it. And I would say that the, any government should not take actions like that against journalists. It is, it is uh, very much hurting for the country. It, it gives a bad repute to the country when you target a journalist. I mean, I don't want to give examples, but this is the where we talk about, when we talk about the other countries' atrocities, we talk about the freedom of working for the journalists. And if there will be restrictions for journalists in Pakistan, me and you will be feeling very weak footing when we are talking about other countries, about Kashmir, about Palestine, about other issues, because people will give our examples that what's happening in your country. So here I always say that establishment, government, and the judiciary, they all have to play their role where they can spot on that there is no question of any kind of crackdown on journalists journalists have the right to say as long as they are doing it within their legal boundaries. That's the only question. If they are not, uh, you know, if they are not affecting anything to the uh, sovereignty of the country, then they should have right to criticize. I mean, journalists criticize for the betterment of the country. That is the whole point. Mm. And whatever things were uh, Imran Riaz was talking, I mean, I, I could be witness many of things happened to me as well. I felt the same way. That, I mean, if you say to me something three years ago and now you are saying, no, it was not right and just 
uh, change at 360 degrees it's... of your opinion. We, as a journalist, cannot change our opinion like that. We are not robots. We need to be convinced. If, if you want us to change our opinion, let us convince us. Otherwise, we will be uh, forced to believe that yeah. there is some other reason behind that. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about that because how do you balance it out? I mean, here, for example, in the UK, we can, as journalists, question and challenge uh, the military, as we've uh, seen over the last 24 hours with the allegations uh, coming out of Afghanistan. But in Pakistan, you know, the army is somewhat involved in, in, the, in the nation. How do you balance that out? How do you get the balance right so that you're able to question, challenge, hold the uh, military to account as well as, you know, respecting their sacrifices uh, and the fact that they are the reason why Pakistan is saved from foreign enemies? I mean, uh, Shafiq, me and person like you, we are the biggest defenders of Pakistan army. We defend them on, alhamdulillah, on the soil of enemies. When we talk, when we talk about with Indian anchors, with other uh, counterparts, uh, we, be, we know that our country is surviving because of our strong uh, army, because of the great sacrifice of our soldiers every day. Pakistan army has the highest rate of number of martyrdom in the officers. Is that the only army who sacrificed every fifth, or, uh, you know, uh, every fifth martyrdom is an army officer. That's the only army in the history for the last 120 years. Otherwise, normally, Sipai and uh, lower rank officers, uh, you know, they got martyred. But in Pakistan army, majors, generals, brigadiers, captains, they gave their life. So there is no question about our loyalty with the army. Only thing is, we just want to have a question that this, if our opinion has a difference from the opinion of the establishment, we should have the right to express our opinion. And we give them an open option that please explain us if we are uh, understood something wrong. And there is nothing harm to ask the question. Basics of Islam allows me and you to ask from anybody in the state. There is nobody above the state and above the law. That is the basic fundamental of Islamic state, whether it is an Islamic army, whether it is a government. I'll tell you one important thing. In this whole scenario, according to my information, mm -hmm. actually uh, government and some elements who are anti-establishment, who are anti-PTI, they are using, uh, you know, these people to establish a narrative against army. They want PTI to come on, you know, come against army on front uh, so that there will be a big conflict between Pakistan army and the supporters of PTI and the journalists from PTI or who follows that narrative. But as far as the army is concerned, army is trying to maximum to be irrelevant. Yeah. So, you, so, so, so you do think that the, the relationship between Imran Khan and the army has been broken and that it can be repaired? I believe that they are not broken at that level where it cannot be repairable. They are repairable. There's only two things. One, we always say that sense should prevail. Both sides should, uh, should work on the, on the possible uh, avenues where they can restart the relations. You know, Pakistan Army and Imran Khan government have the exemplary relation, working relations, no, uh, I mean, better than any government in the last 75 years. So why can't they come on the same page again? Yes, there is a, there are confusions, there are incidents, uh, there are grievances from the both hands, especially from PTI end. But I believe that, I mean, uh, uh, the, the establishment should step forward and uh, try to remove uh, those, address those issues. But I'll tell you one thing, Imran Khan is keep saying one thing in every public gathering, that do not say anything a word against army or its soldiers. We may have difference of opinion with some of the senior officers or, uh, or decision makers in army, but it does not mean that we should have any kind of enmity or any kind of uh, rivalry with Pakistan Army. Pakistan Army is our defender. Yeah. They are defender for um, the day one. They will defend the country against all the enemies who are keeping an eye on Pakistan to break the Pakistan into many pieces. Yeah, well, uh, I know you're going to stay with us. When we come back after the break, we'll be looking 
uh, just to kind of wrap up the conversation uh, about Pakistan. And then we'll be, as I promised, looking at the US president, Joe Biden. He's been in office for 18 months. This will be his first visit as president of the United States to the Middle East. He's arrived in Israel uh, and the occupied Palestinian territories is on his agenda. And it'll be the first meeting between a US president and a Palestinian since 2017. We'll talk about that and the impact of his various engagements over the next few days. Right, let's take a for another break. I was in that final. It's not, we're not even nowhere near the end of the program. We'll take a very quick break. We'll be back very shortly. Join us on the other side of this. Welcome back. I told you it was going to be short. Uh, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shabik. I'm joined by the excellent uh, and powerful broadcaster and commentator and journalist uh, extraordinaire. Um, Hamid Al Mashriki is still my guest. He's with us uh, for the next uh, 30 or so minutes. So, Hamid, uh, US President Joe Biden has arrived on his first official visit to the Middle East. He's in Israel tonight. Uh, he'll meet the Palestinian president. Uh, later on at the end of this week. What do you make of uh, his visit to the Middle East? And do you think there's any chance that there could be a reopening of negotiations between the Israelis and the Palestinians? Uh, uh, there are two aspects of this visit. One, the tensions between Palestinians and Israelis are very highest level at the moment again. Because what they did in Jenin, what, uh, what latest Mascars, they did it in just, uh, uh, I think, five days ago and then two weeks ago. So Israeli, uh, you know, armed forces and Israeli government atrocities are continued. How can you expect, how can you expect them to, uh, uh, you know, to do any kind of peaceful agreement? There is no way that there could be any peaceful agreement when Israelis are doing their atrocities. Second thing is very important. I mean, you might find it surprising what I'm going to tell you. That uh, why Joe Biden is talking only with Mahmoud Abbas of PLO? You know the reason? Because they find him, uh, they think that it is hard, easy, uh, it is much easy to convince Mahmoud Abbas. But as a matter of reality, Mahmoud Abbas is not that much popular in, in, the, in the entire Palestinians. He's popular in West Bank. He's not popular in, in uh, Gaza Strip. He's not popular where Hamas controls. So... Uh, I mean, whatever the decision they would try to uh, take uh, through Mahmoud Abbas, it will cannot be implemented easily or full completely because Mahmoud Abbas is, is not has not got that much authority anymore. Mm. I mean, although he is the head of PLO, but he has not got the public popularity among Palestinians because they are not happy with the uh, with the, the way he dealt uh, with two years, one and a half year ago at the matter of. Uh, uh, you know, Sheikh Jarrah and the matter of uh, uh, bombardment on Gaza Strip. And there were some other matters, uh, even the recent killings in Jenin, because Jenin comes in the West part where there is a popularity of PLO. So mm -hmm. I believe that Joe Biden has to be very open if he really wants to resolve the issue. I, am al I always find Americans, they are trying to enforce their decision. They are trying to enforce... Palestinians, they are not trying to resolve the issue of uh, Israel because there is only one solution, and that is two states, two independent states, where, uh, you know, the capital for the Palestine will be uh, uh, Tel Aviv, right? So, the, you know, so that is the only thing. Otherwise, if they think that, the, you know, uh, without the issue resolving the capital issue, Jerusalem's issue, without resolving the issues of uh, you know, uh, traveling for yeah, the yeah. traveling for the Palestinians, they will not be able to reach to any uh, agreement. And what's interesting, he's not going to Ramallah, which is the de facto capital where the president Mahmoud Abbas and his government is based. He's going to Bethlehem, which is obviously a religious significance. He's a practicing Catholic, um, and so th there may be a religious aspect to that Bethlehem. Um, you know, su such an important city in terms of the Christian faith. Do you, and, and we know that some of these human rights organizations have put, you know, banners out everywhere in Bethlehem that will greet him, that will demonstrate. And the accusation is that the Israeli 
um, government um, is involved in apartheid when it comes to the Palestinians. Obviously, it's something which the Israelis deny. Um, how do you think? How, how do you think the meeting with Mahmoud Abbas? Because it's the first time he's meeting somebody since 2017. He's the first U.S. president to meet um, the Palestinian president. How do you think that meeting will go? Uh, as I said, I mean, this meeting will be only based on one agenda, and that will be to put the pressure on Mahmoud Abbas maximum that he would openly accept the. Uh, uh, you know, Israeli, uh, you know, apartheid one way or the other. And they, they would try to, uh, you know, uh, make uh, Mahmoud Abbas like he's the only decision maker. The only thing I'm trying to explain uh, in different lectures with the uh, Americans that they need to understand that the, uh, the people of Palestine are, at the moment, they want a peaceful resolution with two states. Uh, there, if there is no two independent states, Mahmoud Abbas cannot do anything, whatever, even if he agrees. That's the whole point. Joe Biden is trying to take this message to the Gulf that he has managed to bring to, to some kind of peace in uh, Israel, uh, Palestine. But as a matter of fact, I believe that even the Arab countries know that Mahmoud Abbas cannot uh, obtain or achieve the peace uh, on his own. They need the support or agreement from the Hamas and the other stakeholders. There are oh, so many other organizations who had been fighting against Israeli occupation. So uh, this is the main question at the moment that until and unless Israeli authorities, American government, they combinedly decide that they want yeah. a peaceful solution, then they need to go towards the two-state solution. Mm. Otherwise, I'm sorry, there will be no peace. Yeah, and, and, and you talk about um, the, the Gulf countries. We know that the UAE, Bahrain... Uh, and others, Morocco uh, and Egypt already have relationships with Israel. The big, the big beast, if you like, uh, in terms of you know having negotiations and a settlement uh, with, the, uh, with the Israelis would be Saudi Arabia. Now, King Salman has said, unless the Palestinian cause is resolved, uh, he would never support um, bilateral relations with Israel. Do you believe him? Or do you think President Biden will be going into those talks with him on Saturday, uh, uh, urging him to actually uh, come to some sort of arrangement with the Israelis? I would like to recall you that in his last six months, President Trump did his best to make his Saudi Arabia to start diplomatic relations with Israel, like he managed to uh, force uh, UAE and Bahrain and other countries. But they have failed to do it so with Saudi Arabia. And I should appreciate uh, MBS for uh, handling so much pressure from Trump administration. He's going to handle the same pressure again as long as he, he stays or see, he stick to his uh, stance that resolution or, uh, of Palestinian issue is the only key for Saudi Arabia to start diplomatic relations. Because, uh, Shafiq, the problem is that Saudi, if Saudi Arabia accepts Israel and start diplomatic relations, you can imagine how much pressure it would be to the nuclear country like Pakistan, the only nuclear country in the world, Muslim country in the world. So Pakistan will be under enormous pressure as well. So that's why Pakistan is, in a way, uh, doesn't want that Saudi Arabia to accept Israel uh, as a diplomatic relation. And... Uh, I believe that until and unless MBS is not fully satisfied, he will still manage to resist it. And uh, if until unless they have some uh, drastic plan to force him uh, or to, I don't want to say, but the CIA uses their tricks. So if they force him with that trick, I can't say, but I yeah, believe that yeah. MBS would try not to accept Israel at this stage because they have seen the recent atrocities by Israeli uh, mm. forces. Yeah, and, and obviously, isn't it going to be historical that the U.S. President Joe Biden's plane uh, will leave Israel and fly directly to Saudi Arabia? And that's never happened before. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that is like a message uh, which Americans wants to give to Saudi Arabia that this is how close you can be together, that you can just fly from Jerusalem and you can reach to uh, Jeddah or Riyadh and then you fly back. This is all, uh, you know, every movement, it has a significant, uh, I should say, uh, uh, signs for uh, the diplomats to understand whether they use the cup of tea, whether the way they shake hands, whether their body language. 
So they count, everything counts in diplomatic relations. But I believe uh, that, uh, I mean, whether it was many issues uh, for Mohammed bin Salman in the last three, four years, he managed to handle all the pressure. So I, I, I believe and I pray that he should not come under that much pressure of Joe Biden, because to be honest, Joe Biden is losing his own popularity in America. He's at the lowest popularity level. So he does not have a fully support from his own uh, public. So uh, MBS should not be worried that he's making Americans angry. He is the president who's losing his popularity, and he is using this Israel and Arab countries' trip to regain his popularity back home in America. Yeah, well, we don't know if that's going to happen. Let's see if we can take a call quickly on this. Uh, we've got about three minutes before the break. Uh, Salam alaikum, we live on British Muslim TV. Salam alaikum, Mr. Sharik. Yeah. I'm Yusuf from Lower South, Birmingham. Hello. And uh, Salam alaikum, brother. I'm going to just say, is, uh, why is uh, Biden going to Israel first? Why can't he go to Palestine first and talk to Mahmoud Abbas? Because you know why? Because uh, Israel wants attention. And because uh, of the tension, there's war in uh, uh, with uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, Yemen or Yemen, and the Palestine issue can't be solved until Biden goes to the Palestinians because well he's going he's going uh, sorry he's going on Friday yeah he's going to Bethlehem and speaking to Mahmoud Abbas yeah, and his he government should, instead of going to Bethlehem or whatever he should have gone to Palestine first then they going to Israel. Because, you know, this Shabbat government, you know, the Shabbat won't talk to uh, India because India is uh, not saying nothing about Kashmir because India is using Shabbat okay. uh, uh, to uh, this weekend and give you this. They're not going to give nothing. And okay. Saudi Arabia is working with Shabbat government to keep uh, Shabbat government uh, mouth shut because they're paying the money and that. Okay. And well, that uh, we'll, we'll uh, and, and thank you for your opinion and we were really grateful that you shared it. But obviously, um, and that would be something which the Shabazz Sharif government would uh, profoundly disagree. Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif of Pakistan would disagree with that. I mean, bilateral relationships are very, very important on the diplomatic stage. We've got about 60 seconds, uh, Hamid, before our very quick break. But and we'll summarize this just after the break. Just. Diplomacy is really, really important in these parts of yes, the world. definitely. No, 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 definitely. That's the only solution. You know, uh, in this world, in this modern era, wars are not the solution. Diplomacy is the only solution. And where the, all the, you know, stakeholders have to mentally agree to resolve the issue with talks, dialogues, and diplomacy, where uh, that's the only solution. If any country or any, uh, you know, uh, superpower thinks their might will work, no, sorry. This is 21st century. It will worsen the matters, nothing else. Diplomacy is the only solution to resolve all the disputed issues in the world. Mm. Um, I know you're going to stay with us just for the final bit of the program. We're going to summarize. I don't understand where the time has gone, but uh, we're going to take mm -hmm. our break uh, now. And then we will be back after this, which I think um, is a break. Don't be going anywhere. It's a slightly longer break. I'll still be waiting, watching you, wherever you are around the world. Join us on the other side of this. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq. I'm still joined by Hamid Al Mashriki. Uh, Hamid, by so you don't think um, we will we'll get anything, you know? of substance, if you like, of U.S. president's visit to the Middle East? Not at this moment, not at this stage, because uh, the intentions are not uh, very clear so far. And, uh, you know, uh, if you look into the history of this visit, it is a bit haphazard visit. It is not like planned. It was planned a few months ago, then they cancelled it, then all of a sudden they said, let's complete it. And, you know, in Israel, political destability is, uh, you know, one government is gone and now there's another call for election. There's no stability in Israel, uh, you know, parliament and the government itself. So we cannot expect when there is not stable political government on the both sides, whether it is in Palestine and especially in Israel. And, I mean, uh, they are not in this position 
and the current Israeli government is very hardliner towards uh, Palestinians, and they are more towards like uh, going for further expansions. They're going for further, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure of Israelis and other. So uh, when there is a power, government like that, you cannot expect a diplomatic solution. And obviously, Palestinians are not going to budge anything less than a uh, two-state solution. They, this is what they are fighting for last six decades now. And uh, I think so that is, uh, more than anything, Joe Biden will complete this visit with a significant photo shoots, and that's it. Yes, in, okay. in Arab countries, okay. they will have some uh, billion-dollar agreements, and that's it. Do you know what I love about you? Just tell it as it is, um, which is a breath of fresh air when you have guests. Right, final question. I hope you give me a, three minutes to answer this, but I hope you give me the same sort of upfront answer. Who do you think is going to win these by-elections uh, in, the, in Punjab on Sunday? Oh, I think uh, uh, BTI will win more seats, definitely. Uh, but uh, uh, because uh, uh, Shabash needs, uh, Hamza Shabazz needs only nine seats, so it could be like a tie, like uh, Shabazz, Hamza Shabazz could win 10 seats, and 10 seats or nine seats for uh, 11 seats for PTI. So even despite of winning the more seats, uh, PTI may not be able to form their government. So it is going to be very critical. But I, I think if it is a fair and free elections without using any public or you know government powers, I believe uh, PTI have much more better chances. Mm. Although um, Shabash is doing their best, Hamza Shabash is doing well, their best. We're going to wait on Sunday and see if that happens. And final question, the IMF deal which apparently was coming, has been coming for weeks. Just in 60 seconds, just tell us, where are we in terms of the IMF deal with Pakistan? Is it happening or is it on the back burner? Uh, uh, oh, very important question. Two things. One, IMF is absolutely humiliating Pakistani government at the moment. And I was very offended the way they are doing these uh, you know, dialogues. I believe that Pakistan government should stop under a protest because they are putting so many conditions and Pakistan government is doing every possible thing they are asking to do, whether increasing the petrol prices, electric prices, gas prices. Still, IMF is demanding more and more and more. So I, will, I think uh, IMF is not going to do a very favorable agreement with Pakistan because they know that the government is not very stable. That is the question. If there is a strong, stable government, IMF would have been uh, dialogued in a different way. Because at the moment, they are themselves shaky about their existence uh, in terms of Pakistan government. So that's why uh, they are making sure that the government will agree on every possible thing, which is nearly a humiliation for the government. Well, absolutely. Thank you so much. We're going to keep an eye on this. I know you'll come back and tell us. Um, and we'll hold you to account to see if you got it right. Maybe 10 seats for PTI and 10 yeah. seats uh, for Pakistan Muslim yeah. League and the Nawaz. Uh, thank you so much, Definitely. Hamid. I will love you. See you very you. soon. Uh, that was Hamid al-Mashriki, the broadcaster and commentator, joining us uh, live from Manchester. Now, what we're looking at, we're looking at what is happening in Pakistan. Uh, obviously, Imran Khan was deposed after that vote of confidence in April, uh, where he left office. And, and then his party decided to resign from the National Assembly because they said they weren't willing to accept crooks and criminals who they label who are now in government, Chabar Sharif and uh, Bilawal Zadari, Bhutto and others. Obviously, they would be, they would disagree with that allegation. Uh, but that's how Imran Khan and his party described it. They left and resigned from the assembly. Um, and they, one aim, if you like, for the Pakistani Tahrik e Insaf party is elections. They want fresh elections and they want it this year. Uh, whereas the coalition government is having to take some very tough economic decisions um, to try to, as um, our guest Hamid al-Mashriki was talking just before the break around the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, negotiations with the Pakistani government uh, for that new bailout that they said it wouldn't happen uh, until Pakistan had removed the fuel subsidies that the Imran Khan government had brought in. And you see the cost of petrol and diesel in Pakistan has shot up um, in historic uh, levels. Inflation is massively on the increase and the cost of living crisis is affecting millions of people. As it is here in this country, you know we're all struggling with the cost of living crisis. We see the cost of petrol and diesel go up day after day. 
And at times you ask the question, if we are struggling to cope during these difficult times, how is it for the people of Pakistan, many of those laborers who struggle uh, on a day rate, and if they don't have any work for that particular day, they don't get paid. And it's really, really tough. And so that's the to and fro of Pakistani politics. What do you make of things in Pakistan? You don't necessarily have to be supportive of Imr Imran Khan or Nawaz Sharif or Shabazz Sharif, the current prime minister, or Hamza Shabazz um, Sharif, who is the chief minister in Punjab. And we know we've got those by-elections happening on Sunday. It'll be interesting to see who wins those by-elections. And depending on who wins them, they could be the people who either save a Pakistan Muslim League, PML, Noon, uh, government, both in the centre, in Islamabad, at a federal level, but also actually at a provincial level in Nahor as well, and potentially make them win the next election. So what did Imran Khan do right? What did he do wrong? The accusation is that he, um, the relationship with the powerful neutrals, as they described the military, had broken down and um, that, he, that the neutrals withdrew their support. Um, neutrals, I mean, certainly just a unique thing in Pakistan in, in terms of the military relationship. But as Hamid was talking, it's very, very difficult for you to criticise the, the military um, regime, if you like, the military, um, whose job it is to protect the nation uh, from both foreign and domestic threats. And then the other question we're asking you to consider and we want you to ring us as well, 01924-231-083. What now for peace between the Israelis and the Palestinians? How important is it that as Joe Biden, the US president, arrives in the Middle East tonight uh, for his first bilateral meeting in the Middle East, his first tour to the Middle East since he became president of the United States, uh, he'll be meeting Israeli Prime Minister Lapid, uh, the opposition leader, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israelis are uh, in the midst of an election campaign, therefore he'll be meeting the leader of the opposition as well as the uh, government. And then on Friday, he's expected to travel to the West Bank city, uh, the Palestinian occupied territory, West Bank city of Bethlehem, where he'll meet with Mahmoud Abbas. This will be the first meeting between a US president and a Palestinian uh, leader, since 2017, it just happens President uh, Obama was the last president to meet with uh, President uh, Mahmoud Abbas. President Donald Trump decided to not meet with uh, the Palestinians and he downgraded uh, diplomatic relations with the Palestinians. What do you make of that? What do you make of the sense that there is rumours that the Saudis um, are being encouraged uh, to come to uh, a historic uh, deal uh, of diplomatic relations with the Israelis. The Israelis desperately want the Saudis uh, to, re uh, to have diplomatic relations. And the Saudis are very, very cautious because on the one hand, there is the conflict, if you like, in the Middle East, uh, the, the geopolitics um, in terms, the geopolitics uh, of Middle Eastern affairs with Iran and, and the fear uh, of the nuclear uh, program and the nuclear talks between Western nations and Iran. So do you think President Biden's visit will be successful? And do you think uh, that Imran Khan and the current government in Pakistan of Shabazz Sharif, uh, who will win this tussle this weekend? It's on Sunday. Uh, polls probably close around five o'clock Pakistan time, I think it's five, six o'clock in the evening. Uh, in Pakistan, which would make it probably about two o'clock in the afternoon here. And so we do expect to start to see results uh, from probably about seven o'clock um, as well. And I really I'd love to hear what you think about that, uh, in essence, of what's going to happen in Pakistan. Because lots of us here, British Pakistanis, you know, um, born and bred in this country, we still have a connection to that, that beautiful land because it is the land of our forefathers, our parents, our grandparents, our great-grandparents. And so you have that spiritual connection with the land because you know that your parents, like my father's buried there, and so my grandparents are buried there. And so lots of members of my forefathers are buried there. And it's, it's always surreal to go back um, and to visit them every year when I go in October. So what do you make of the role of Pakistan 
and Pakistan politics. Because it has spread out to here in the UK as well. You see the protest on a daily basis outside the office and home of former Prime Minister um, Mohammed uh, Nawaz Sharif uh, by PTI Imran Khan supporters. And then you see it in what many would describe as the despicable scenes, protesters outside Jemima Goldsmith's ha mother's house, who has been divorced from Imran Khan for many, many years. Right, and so that's what we're going to be looking at. Now, in the next uh, half, half an hour of the programme, um, we want to move on to the next topic. Now, developing young professionals is an important aspect how our young people can develop and grow in the UK. What support do they need and how can they excel in the workplace and wider society? Professor Wakar Ahmed set up the Young Professional Society. It was set up to help support and change lives of young people by providing personal and professional development. Professor Wakar Ahmed is the president of the Young Professional Society and I'm pleased to say he's joining us live from Chorley in Lancashire. So now after the break, we're going to head to Chorley in Lancashire and we're going to talk about how young people... I used to be young at the time. I still like to think I'm pretty young. But anyway, youngsters as in teenage, teenagers. Like me and James are still young, but um, teenagers. How can we inspire them to get on in their professional careers? Where are the positive role models? What are op the opportunities? Join us and we'll talk about this after the break. Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV, live from our studios here in Wakefield. We'll be taking your calls now, so we're opening the lines on 01924-231-083. Or get in touch with us on our social media handle, British Muslim TV. Professor Wakar, assalamu alaikum, a very warm welcome to the program. Great to have this conversation. Wa alaikum, salam, Shafiq. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for coming, sir. Now, tell us, when and why uh, was YPS set up? So YPS uh, was set up uh, just before the uh, pandemic uh, hit. And the reason it was set up was to provide opportunities for uh, young professionals uh, to support their development and professional uh, achievement. And the main focus was uh, to try to develop the soft skills that uh, young professionals need to succeed. Uh, we felt that, uh, you know, uh, once uh, youngsters go to university, they achieve uh, a lot of academic skills and uh, they achieve a lot of subject knowledge, but uh, often the soft skills are lacking. So we set up this society to try and provide some guidance and support and mentoring for uh, soft skills. So things like creative writing, public speaking, accelerating learning technologies, uh, practical leadership, entrepreneurship. And we felt that if these skills uh, were supplemented with the technical knowledge that uh, young uh, professionals gain from university, they would be a lot more successful uh, very, very quickly. So we decided to set up this uh, society. Now, Dr. Nasser Ali is the uh, um, founder, chairman. Um, how did you meet and how did you get involved and be inspired to be involved in YPS? So I've known Dr. Ali since he was a youngster, since I was doing my PhD many years ago. And gradually I've mentored him from a young kid to getting his degree and then masters. And then eventually he did a PhD with me at uh, Manchester Metropolitan University. And as a youngster, he was uh, extremely shy and reserved and stuff. But as uh, he was working with me, not only did he develop good uh, uh, skills in nanotechnology, but he also developed uh, confidence to uh, speak in public. So for example, he's, second talk that he ever did he went to america uh, to san diego and he gave a talk at a conference with about 500 people and he won the prize for the best uh, research paper presentation and that prize was called the bunshaw prize and then uh, he decided that uh, you know we should work together in trying to uh, do something similar for other youngsters to develop their confidence and their skills in order for them to uh, succeed. So I've known Dr. Ali for a long, long time. 
Uh, I've developed uh, in that time uh, a career in academia, going from a lecturer to a senior lecturer, eventually to a chair in nanotechnology, director of enterprise at the University of Lincoln. And the mistakes that uh, we have made, uh, and uh, it's taken us a bit longer to get to where we are, we don't want the youngsters to make the same mistakes so they can get there a lot faster than we can get there. We got there. Yeah, that's really, really important because I think it's important for our young people to have those positive role models looking up. Um, and, and probably that's what um, NASA, who uh, we were going to speak to uh, later on in the month, um, would have seen in you. What are the characteristics that, that young people should be looking for in a positive role model to professionally develop? So I think it's where people obviously emulate and model other professionals. So it's very, I think first and foremost, you need to be a good role model for, uh, for the youngsters. And good role model doesn't mean having outstanding knowledge of your subject. Of course, that's important. But good role models means you have to have a very high standard of behavior. You have to have honesty. You have to have integrity. And uh, you have to uh, tell the truth, and be, and people should be able to rely on your word. So having uh, all the characteristics that a good Muslim should have, uh, modesty and honesty and integrity, uh, they come part and parcel of a good role model. So it's not just e excellence in your chosen field, but it's also having excellence of uh, character and uh, integrity. Yeah, and 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 leadership is really really important. Many young people don't understand what leadership is. Just simply tell us what it is. What is leadership? It's not so being a manager, first, is it? Yeah, so uh, the first aspect of leadership is, first of all, you know, you have to uh, lead yourself. So you have to get yourself to uh, raise your own standards and live by these uh, high standards yourself. So when you have uh, high standards of uh, uh, integrity and skills and achievement and the desire to be the best in your particular field, but also desire to be the best human being that you can possibly be. So constantly, every day, you have to work on yourself and lead yourself to a higher level. And that's a constant lifetime struggle for every individual who wants to succeed in the long term. And then uh, once you think you know, you're achieving and you never get to the ultimate level because you're constantly striving, then what you want to do is you want to uh, influence young people to uh, achieve their full potential and also become the best people and the best in their particular field. Uh, and, uh, and now we live in a very interconnected world. So it's very easy for us to get access to the best uh, people in the world because we can connect them uh, via the internet and things like that. So I think the main thing about leadership is influencing yourself to be the best you can be and then influencing young people, other people, and your team to be the best they can possibly be in terms of technical skills, in terms of character, in terms of uh, making a world a difference in the world. Yeah, and that's really important because the Young Professional Society encourages P young people to become members of the society. What sort of activities do you run to help them get that leadership uh, upskill? So what we wanted to do, of course, you can get academic knowledge from, uh, you know, YouTube and Internet and courses that you do in the university. What we wanted to do is provide them with some experiential knowledge. So we started off running uh, uh, clubs. So we had a young speakers club running in South Manchester and also in uh, North Manchester. And uh, we had a young writers club and young leaders club where it's not just so. Uh, people learning theory about speaking and writing and leading, but also uh, having practical exercise, they would do the... Yeah. Uh, in order to develop oh. their uh, leadership skills, lead a group. So in addition, we had some courses on leadership. So we had a course on practical leadership. We also wanted to increase the academic standards. We had the GCSE Accelerating Learning course, which was trying to cover science and mathematics. Uh, we had a course on creativity, memory training, accelerated learning, and uh, a lot of the technologies that I've learned, and a lot of the experience I've had, I put it together into a book, which uh, I've called Success Secrets. And it's a practical uh, guide to how uh, somebody can become successful and become a good leader. 
So that should be coming out uh, very soon. I often get to say this because I'm in Yorkshire at the moment, uh, the studio, so I can always say, uh, give Lancashire a plug and I can even do it tonight and I've got an excuse because I'm talking to you at Wakar Bay. Um, let's just talk about this bit of collaboration going on. Um, the Leaders Council of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, which is headed by the former Home Secretary and Labour MP, Lord David Blunkett. Um, tell us about the collaboration and what you want to achieve from it. So the Leaders Council uh, recently invited uh, myself and uh, Dr Nasser Ali uh, to go on their uh, podcast and they interviewed us about the activities of the Young Professional Society and by and uh, working with them. So basically I think uh, they are mainly catered for business professionals and, uh, and we thought by collaborating with them we could get access to a lot of successful professionals all over Great Britain and Ireland to help us mentor the young uh, professionals to become uh, leaders. So I think it's a very nice collaboration where we can learn from the experienced leaders who have already been successful and uh, we can uh, impart knowledge and experience uh, very quickly to the youngsters. So we're gonna be working together and uh, supporting each other in developing uh, young, young leaders. Yeah. Um, and what's the support been like from senior professionals? We're talking about the political leadership, if you like, in the Leaders' Council. But beyond that, let's say in law, in business, uh, Alhamdulillah, lots of people from our communities have been successful. What's the support you're getting for them to be mentors, yeah, so, so role initially, models? Uh, initially, I have a very extensive ne network of academics in uh, universities all over the world in various different uh, subjects. I haven't been in the field for many, many years. And Dr. Ali has a, an extensive network called uh, NanoSmart, where he's got uh, all the professionals in or I say, every single country in the world that is working on uh, nanotechnology. So initially, we're using our own uh, professional networks and uh, personal networks to get out there and reach to people. And uh, we've been humbled by the support of these uh, professional leaders. I know they are very, very busy but they've been very keen to give their time and support and encouragement to us to keep this uh, work, uh, work uh, going. And uh, our ambition is to try to make uh, this uh, Young Professional Network global. Uh, we've got global contacts with senior people, but we want to globally to connect uh, young professionals together as well so that they can uh, learn uh, from uh, one another. The great thing about this uh, Young Professional Society is also it's not uh, discipline specific. So we've got people from different disciplines. So if you look at your own particular discipline, for example, plus or minus 10 percent, uh, the top professionals are doing exactly the same thing. And they might be one or two percent better than each other. But when you look at uh, insights coming from different fields, you can often make a quantum leap. So, for example, uh, if you look at sports, yeah, the runners, they used to say, if you lift weights, you become muscle bound, you're not going to be very fast. So in the early days, they never did any uh, weight training. But later on, they said, right, we want to lift weights. We want to make our muscles stronger. If we can make our muscles stronger, we can be faster as well. So by having insights from uh, weightlifting, uh, they built strength for running. Similarly, in, uh, in professional fields, uh, we can learn an enormous amount from each other from different professions. And if we can pick up one or two insights from different professions, we can elevate ourselves to the next level. So having a multidisciplinarity of experts available to us, I think uh, we can make a big difference to uh, young professionals. Uh, from the Young Professional Society, uh, we'll talk about that conference, we'll talk about the opportunities that you can get involved with it and benefit from that. Because really leadership uh, is, is, all, is quite clear in the word leadership. It's lead the ship. Um, and uh, so, it, yeah, if you break it down by words anyway, um, and, and how youngsters out there can think that they are ready for a leadership role, but in reality, they are not ready. And, and so hopefully uh, you'll be able to join them. And then we'll also talk about their annual conference, which is happening in August, uh, in which I'm really honoured uh, to be a speaker there um, and, and talk about my career journey and leadership uh, journey as well right we'll take a very quick break i think it's our final break of the evening uh, and when we come back we'll continue the important and inspiring conversation with professor wakar ahmed who's joining us live from chorley in beautiful lancashire join us on this side of this
Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back to Questions with me, Mohammed Shafiq, exclusively here on British Muslim TV. We're on Sky Channel 752. We're on social media with the handle British Muslim TV. Wherever you are joining us, a very warm welcome. We're having a very important conversation about leadership, about how we can inspire young people. Yes, you young people watching this tonight at home. How can you be a leader and how can you be successful in your professional career? We're joined by the one and only uh, Professor Wakar Ahmed, uh, who is the president of the... Um, Young Professional Society, um, and uh, he's joining us uh, live from Chorley uh, in Lancashire. We love Lancashire. In my career, I've noticed lots of ethnic minorities feel they're ready for the leadership role, but when you actually sit with them and talk to them and mentor them and support them, um, they've got some work to be done. Yeah, so I think uh, very early on in my career, I did some teaching at the Afro-Caribbean Centre in Mosside. And when I asked uh, people in, uh, that were attending that center, what do you want to be? And they said, oh, we want to be Michael Jordan, or we want to be Michael Jackson. And, we, and these were the role models that these uh, youngsters had that they aspired to. And, uh, and I said, well, what about becoming a scientist? And what about becoming a, 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 a solicitor or a lawyer? What about becoming, you know, going, going into the media? So basically, by talking to them about the different professions, uh, we opened up a lot of different opportunities for these people to go into professions which are lucrative, but the probability of becoming a scientist is much uh, greater than the probability of becoming a elite basketball player like uh, Michael Jordan or Ronaldo or Messi in football. So they... So we gave them a vision which is a bit more realistic, but at the same time highly rewarding. And over a long period of time, it can make a, a bigger contribution than even athletes there, themselves. So, and by providing career guidance for different professionals mm. in different fields, uh, you can give them insight, with their, insight into their future. Because most people in our community, many years ago, they always wanted to be, uh, become a doctor, uh, or a lawyer or something, and they didn't have this broad vision of all the different other professions that are available to youngsters. Yeah, that's really, really important. Now, you've got your conference uh, in August. Tell us about uh, what, what, what people can expect from it. So we decided that uh, we wanted to get to the... A lot of the stuff that we've been doing has been uh, online. So we've had quite a lot of the online uh, webinars for people on various different topics. Uh, so we wanted to get people together face to face. So on the 6th of August, we've got uh, a, a Young Leaders Conference uh, coming up. And this is where, in fact, my uh, book is going to be launched. Uh, uh, and uh, basically, leaders from all over the world are going to come together and they're going to talk about their experiences uh, from uh, Nigeria, from the US, from uh, all over the uh, UK as well. From different professions are coming to uh, to together with the youngsters, and we've got a session uh, called uh, Co Vadima session, which is looking at uh, leadership in a volatile world world for young professionals, and we're hoping that the insights we get from all these uh, top professionals coming from everywhere, we may be able to produce a definitive guide on how to be a successful leader in an increasingly uh, volatile world uh, for young professionals. Uh, also, one of my PhD students who is an imam and he's also uh, getting his PhD very soon, uh, he's written a book on uh, uh, leadership lessons from the Holy Prophet and I think we can learn an enormous amount from our own culture, from our own religion about leadership uh, which will make us a lot more eff effective. And this is aspects of our religion we often completely ignore. And we can't really afford to ignore it if we want to be competitive and if we want to be successful in this uh, increasingly volatile, uh, unpredictable world. Yeah, it's been happening. It's going to happen in the great city of Manchester. There's lots of people there, included uh, myself. I'm really looking forward to actually get to meet you in the flesh um, and, and have that conversation. Um, you recently moved from Manchester to be closer to family. You, you're, you're in um, Chorley now. What's the difference with living in a... How have you found the transition from living in a city to living in a, in, a, in a village or in the countryside? 
Yeah, so the, uh, the first day was very scary because at night it was completely silent and uh, you can't hear, you, know, you can hear the pin drop. That's how uh, it was. Whereas I lived in uh, Whitefield right next to the motor, which is quite noisy. So it's a very peaceful place to think, uh, but the energy level are not the same as uh, what you've got in Manchester. The activities that are going in, in Manchester is not the same as level of activity that's happening in uh, Chorley. But the good thing is I'm closer to my daughter and to, uh, to my granddaughters in Chorley, so I can spend a lot more time uh, time with them. Yeah. So it's been a, a useful, uh, enlightening transition. Um, and when you look back at your career and the journey that you've had, and then you look about what is happening at the moment, where there is still structural racism that exists in so many industries and so many jobs and so many people are unable to break that glass ceiling. What's, what's your message to those viewers to encourage them to keep going? So I, uh, so when I became a, a lecturer, there was only three lecturers from uh, foreign origin at Manchester Metropolitan University in the whole university. And uh, I felt that there was a glass ceiling. I couldn't really get beyond being a, a lecturer. And uh, what I found is that uh, even though I was a lecturer, because I was different, uh, everybody knew me and I could get things done. The vice chancellor knew me. So I didn't really need to work hard to stand out in a crowd because I, I already stood out. And uh, I felt that, uh, you know, uh, by, by having this concept of having a glass ceiling, it made that I limited myself in trying to succeed and try to achieve. So I decided I'm not going to believe in this glass ceiling anymore. Uh, the sky is the limit, and I'm going to be 10 times better than my counterpart. So if I was going to become a lecturer and I had, uh, you know, uh, my fellow lecturer had 10 papers, I was going to have 100 research papers. Uh, so I 10 times everything that I needed to achieve to get to the uh, next level in my own mind. And I felt if I was uh, focused and I was uh, hardworking, I could uh, achieve all these things. So I started to look at my difference, my ethnicity as a huge advantage to me. Wherever I went to a conference, uh, people knew me, it says, uh, hello, Bukhar, uh, how's Salford, how's Manchester, how's this? So everybody knew me. I didn't need to really work hard uh, in order to stand out uh, in, in the crowd. But what I had to do is produce quality work that stood uh, the test of time and quality work that people recognize. So I wrote uh, 600 research papers, I edited wrote 25 books. So when I, so in my university, I'm the most published uh, researcher in my whole university. I've written more books in my university. So I stand out not only because I'm an ethnic minority, because I also focused on uh, getting achievements that would stand the test of time. So what I would, so what I would say that uh, there is uh, the glass ceiling there, the perception of glass ceiling there, but sometimes you are a much uh, bigger enemy of yourself than the glass ceiling that's out there. So if you focus on the work, sooner or later, you will get there and you will achieve great things. So I wouldn't be discouraged by the glass ceiling and about racism, about discrimination. Uh, I also found many people uh, helped and supported me that I didn't expect help and support from. For example, Sir Harold Croucher, who won the Nobel Prize for C60, he wrote the forward for my book. Uh, and to me, a Nobel Prize winner was almost uh, impossible, but because of my going to a conference and being different, he wanted to speak to me. So I always see my difference as a huge advantage in my career rather than a disadvantage. Yeah, so you kind of turn, turn the disadvantage into an advantage and reach you have out. to do I, that, yeah. yeah. I mean, we are made not from what, uh, you know, how. Uh, the more challenges you've got, the greater you can hone your character. So you can't develop as an individual if you don't have challenges. And as you were talking about before, of course, you know, the Holy Prophet had lots of lots of challenges, greater challenges than anybody in the world ever. Yet, uh, you know, he, he, he rose to the challenges. Again, Imran Khan, like you mentioned, had many, many challenges. We kept rising to the challenges and from nowhere, became the best bowler in the world and building hospitals and being the prime minister. Nobody would have expect, expected that. So um, instead of lowering your ambition, you have to say, right, I'm going to go to the next level. I'm going to use this challenge to develop myself to be better than uh, I can possibly be. And there is, no, there is no real limit, only limits in your own mind. 
Yeah, and, and, and I suppose my final question to you is, your, your, your message to young people is to join the Young Professional Society to develop yourself and progress and, and keep going and don't give up. Yeah, so my message is set your targets high yeah. and uh, whatever you're doing, uh, aim to be the best at it. So as a, as, a, so as a son, be the best son you can possibly be. As a parent, be the best parent you can possibly be. As a scientist, be the best scientist, the best lawyer. So what happens when you aim for the best, uh, you'll find that you'll use more of your ability and you'll access more of your mind. So people have done studies where they've looked at uh, domesticated animals and they've looked at wild animals and uh, they found that the brain of the wild animals is uh, significantly bigger th than the brain of a domestic animal. So by having challenges and aiming to the, be the best and overcome challenges, I think uh, we can achieve anything that we set our mind to. And that's my message for the young professionals. And if you join the society, that message was going to be constantly hammered into your brain that you are the best, you just have to prove it now. Well, you've truly inspired me tonight, uh, if I may say so, Dr. Wakar. Um, I really uh, got some energy there um, to kind of progress in, in terms of one's career. But thank you so much. I'm looking forward to actually meeting you in the flesh uh, at the conference uh, in, uh, in August, August the 6th, I think it is. Um, but yeah, Young Professional Society. Uh, that was uh, Professor Wakar Ahmed. Best wishes to you and the family, sir. Um, uh, joining us live from Chorley in the great county of Lancashire, the only county that matters in the United Kingdom. I can get away with that this time of the night. Um, anyway, thank you so much uh, to everybody, particularly thank you to Hamid al-Mashriki, to Professor uh, Wakar Ahmed, uh, and to all of you who um, are back. And yes, we are back after the short um, break uh, over Hajj and Eid. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you for your messages. And apologies if we're not able to get through some of them. We'll be back next Wednesday at the same time of 8.30, live here on British Muslim TV. From me, Mohammed Shafiq, and the whole team here at British Muslim TV, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great weekend and look after yourself and each other. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.